Hey guys, Mr. Fitch here. We are going to be starting our brand new unit on ancient China. I'm going to go through this PowerPoint. Uh, today, I would expect you to please take notes on a piece of paper, like how you would as if you were in class. Um, I'm going to go through it pretty fast, but you have the advantage you don't have when you're in class. You're watching this on YouTube or whatever, which means you have the power to push pause. So if I go to the next slide, well, push pause and rewind, right? Okay, having said that, let's start talking about ancient China, all right? Now, when we talk about China, you have to remember our seven key principles of civilization. All ancient civilization starts near a river or some ocean or body of water. You have the Nile in Egypt. You have the Tigris and Euphrates in um, the Middle East. Um, you have down here in India, you have the Indus River. We didn't talk about that, but that's okay. And China is no exception. In China, we have the Yellow River or the Yangtze River, okay? So every ancient civilization is going to start by fresh water somewhere. Um, China has ridiculously huge mountains to its west and east. It has a uh, flat land, so most people are going to settle along this area here. Even today, most Chinese people are going to live um, almost exclusively along the east coast of China because you have the Gobi Desert. Um, up here and then you got the mountains down here and so China is protected from attacks from her enemies um, with the ocean over here and stuff but in terms of where people can live it might be one of the largest countries in the world but the actual places where people live are actually pretty limited okay um, Chinese civilization began, like I said, along the Hanghe River, mostly up here, in a fertile flat plain, not all that different than ancient Mesopotamia. And um, the problem, however, much like the um, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, um, the, the flooding was very, very irregular, okay? It would flood at different times of year. It seems like only the Nile River was the best place for... Um, uh, things to grow because the Nile River was reliable and dependable and would flood at the same time every year. Um, the Yangtze River or the Yellow River, it did not. It flooded very irregularly and so the nickname for the river is called the River of Sorrow because when the river would flood, people didn't realize it was about to flood and farmers were out there planting crops near it and they would drown from the flood waters. It would come like a, like a little mini tsunami kind of thing, right? So lots of farmers would die, and so the river was called the River of Sorrow. So yeah, let's go to the River of Sorrow. Woo! Yeah. Um, here's an ancient map of China, how the Chinese saw themselves. The Chinese people saw themselves as being the center of the world, okay? Here's an ancient Chinese map from um, uh, the Middle Age period in Europe, at least. Um, the, the, this is a, a time that, so the Chinese circumnavigated the entire globe before Columbus even uh, was born, okay? Columbus did not discover America. He was just the last person to discover America. The Chinese sailed around the world around um, the 13, 1400s, realized that, wow, no one is as advanced and civilized as we are. So they said, instead of conquering people, they said, screw it, we're going to be isolationists. They went home, they destroyed their large, giant, ocean-going ships, they sank them into the water, and they said, we're just going to stay here and be by ourselves because nobody else is as advanced as we are. So you can see over here they had, uh, you know, North America, South America, a little bit of Antarctica down there. Um, the islands and whatnot, Africa, Europe. So, so yeah, the Chinese, they went around the whole planet before Columbus was even born. So, just saying. Um, China, like I said, they call themselves the Middle Kingdom or the Central Kingdom, meaning that they see themselves as the center of the world, okay? And this reflects their opinion about the world. Everything revolves around them. Um, Kind of in the same way that if you see a map today of the world, um, everything where England is the center point, okay? we Our time that we have today in the United States is based off of English time, okay? So when it's, you know, seven, we're seven hours behind um, Greenwich time. Well, where's Greenwich? Right in England, okay? Where, you know, we are here in Arizona, we are... Um, 
depending on what time of year it is, we're either mountain time or Pacific time, right? So we based our times today off of England, but the Chinese in the ancient times, they saw themselves as the center of the world, okay? And in many ways it was true because they were far more advanced than most countries and civilizations were for centuries. Um, so that again, when the Chinese realized that they were more advanced than everyone, they basically turned their backs on the West and they faced East and they basically said, we're going to just focus on us and our area. So Korea, Japan, Taiwan, um, they had no interest in what was West of them, the Middle East, Turkey, Greece, Italy, Europe, they, they had no interest in any of that. It's pretty crazy. So, like I said, these empires begin to emerge, and the Chinese Empire um, does as well. And some of the earliest achievements that the Chinese are going to have, they're going to develop uh, pottery wheels. Okay, if you ever seen a kim, a kim, a kim, I think that's what they're called, a kim, a kim yeah, kim. Um, wheel for making pottery. They were the first to develop that. Um, they would use bricks for their houses. They are the ones who invented silk, right? And they were also the ones who developed very intricate irrigation systems, okay? So, uh, one of the most famous people, um, obviously, he's famous because he, uh, he invented silk, or at least he found the worms that make the silk, and he started to harvest them the way that we uh, use bees today to make our honey. He would have all of these silkworms um, producing silk for him, so he started like a silk farm, if you will. Um, and his name was Young T, and he basically taught the people how to make silk. For a long time, the Western world had no idea how it was made. Um, they just said, oh, it comes from the East. It was made by the gods. So um, that's what how rare and amazing silk was at that time in history. Um, another important person from Chinese history, his name was just Yu. Um, and he's the one who basically is going to teach the people how to do the irrigation system. I know the hats, right? The hats. You gotta love the hats. It looks like a flat board with beads. It's like a weird looking graduation hat, right? With just way more tassels. <laughs> Um, but the dynasty that's going to emerge first um, in China is going to be the Shang Dynasty. And they're going to be around for almost 700 years, okay? They're basically going to set the foundation for every other dynasty that comes after them. Remember, a dynasty is father, son, grandson, great-grandson, great-great-grandson, great-great-grandson. It's basically one family in control for a long period of time. And when that family dies out and another family takes over, then you have a new dynasty, okay? And the Shang Dynasty, their capital is going to be the city of Yin, which is founded in 1384 BC. So right around the time that Moses brings the, the children of Israel into the Promised Land, and their 40 years of captivity is over, or 40 years of wandering in the desert is over, and Joshua takes them into the Promised Land, begins to conquest. That's about when the Chinese are setting up their first kingdom as far as their capital city goes. And here it is today. You can see today it's nothing but ruins and farmland, and it's, it's definitely a shell of its former glory 3,300 years later. <laughs> um, so what are some th achievements of the Shang Dynasty? Um, Oracle Bones, they developed one of the earliest writing systems, as well as they were the first people who started developing tools made out of bronze and making um, artifacts and pottery and knives and weapons and statues made out of bronze. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, if you're wondering what an oracle bone is, it's basically kind of a way, it's their superstitious pagan way to tell the future. They would basically take a turtle shell and they would try to read the cracks um, and they would come up with a prophecy and then they turn the turtle shell over and they would write that prediction on the turtle shell. It was really, really strange, but the Italians were far stranger. I mean, you have to remember the Romans, they would, you know, they would cut out dead animals and play with their entrails to try to predict the future. So it's a lot of paganism for sure, but um, yeah.
Um, like I said, they are pagans. They believe mostly in an ancestor worship. If you've ever seen the movie Mulan or anything like that, you know that ancestor worship is really big. That means that they worship their dead relatives, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle. Um, anyone who died, anyone in their family who died became like a, a saint to them, like a Catholic saint kind of thing, where they would pray to them and they would ask them for guidance and they, they would ask their ancestors for help because they thought the dead were wiser than the living um, and they had to show them honor and respect as you may remember if you've seen the cartoon Mulan even they highlight that even Disney knows to highlight that so um, many of their rulers they would be buried in large tombs very similar to the Egyptians they would be buried with a lot of stuff some of their wives whether they were dead or not their wives would be buried with them yikes sorry ladies um, so things would go on they would develop the first writing system, and we're going to talk more about this in the days to come because you'll be writing in Chinese as well. Um, and that system is going to come around around 1766, so right around the time that Jacob in the Bible was off doing his thing um, with his 12 sons is when the Chinese were developing their writing system. And in Chinese, you read up to down, right to left, okay? Up to down, right to left to left. And we'll talk more about that in a couple days. Um, the Chinese are very similar to the Egyptians in that they use pictures and symbols to represent words. So over the centuries, um, you know, circles became sun. And so you can see kind of the evolution and how the changing occurred, the metamorphosis of um, some of their symbols. Um, how they started off in ancient times as pictographs. They got a little more wordish, and then today they are far more um, intricate in their wording and letters that they use. So, just some interesting transitions. Um, like I said, they used um, bronze. You can see here a bronze elephant on top of another elephant. Very, very ornate. They developed some very sophisticated forms of smelting the bronze. Um, they were extremely artistic with it. Okay. Um, and here are just some more examples of different bronze work that they had. Um, like I said, they also were the first to start using silkworms. And here you can see them doing it. Here's a woman today making silk, but still using the same old-fashioned techniques of letting the silkworms, I say worms, but they're more like caterpillars would be a more accurate way to think of them. Political power was very different in China than in other places, but um, it's kind of not all that dissimilar to what it was like in medieval Europe where you would have one lord who was in charge of an area and the peasants would work for him. So it was very similar to that. You still had the king on top. The king was in charge of everyone and everything. However, you if you served in the military after you retired, you were re rewarded for your service with land. And then you would have peasants um, and, and workers who would work that land for the noble. Okay, So it's, it's pretty similar to serfdom in that sense. Um, it wasn't always like that in China, but for a lot of Chinese history, it was like that. So, um, one of the favorite pastimes for the uh, nobility, um, for the very rich in um, the Shang Dynasty, was archery. And here you can see them still dressing up in traditional Shang garb, um, Shang garb, today. And they still like to reenact what their ancestors did for fun. It's not all that different than what you and I have at a medieval fair or a Renaissance fair. Um, the king, would, this is pretty crazy too. So bronze was such a valuable weapon, um, so you know, so rare and so important that if you tried to make bronze weapons without a king's permission, you would basically they, he would have you killed. Okay, um, it's like uh, today when you try to go hunting without a deer light, you know, try to go deer hunting or elk hunting without a license, the gay warner will come and you know find you or arrest you. Well, it was more extreme back then. If if you tried to make bronze weapons without getting a certificate from the king, you would be killed. So if you did not have that permission slip off with your head. Um, here are some pretty cool weapons made out of bronze, pretty ornate. For uh, again, this is all BC time, so. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, you can see the bronze. Obviously, it's turning to green, just like the Statue of Liberty. Um, bronze, when it's exposed to oxygen and the elements and, and rain and rust, it, it rusts green, okay? So 
most of this stuff was originally brown, like the Statue of Liberty, but has obviously oxidized and turned green over the centuries. So, um, here's a cool war chariot and still buried with the horses. So when the king got buried, he took his stuff with him, even his horses. So pretty amazing. Um, religiously speaking, the king basically had supreme power. Okay. This is called the Mandate of Heaven. The Mandate of Heaven is a little complicated, but I'll try to explain it in pretty simple terms. Basically, it was the belief that the king was chosen by God to rule. And as long as he did good and provided justice for the people and he served the people well, he had the Mandate of Heaven. Basically, the people thought the gods in heaven were smiling on him. Okay? But if he was corrupt and evil, then the people believed that um, the gods rejected him. So then they could overthrow him and put a new leader in. So basically, if you were a bad king or a bad ruler, the uh, people, the nobility, would rise up and you know try to fight against the corrupt king because they believed that he basically lost the support of heaven. So as long as he was doing good, the people believed that the gods would protect them. But as soon as he started to be a bad king, then he lost divine protection, he lost the protection of heaven, and the people would rise up and remove him and put a new king in charge. It's actually not all that different than what we see in the Bible with Saul um, being replaced by David. God rejects Saul because Saul was an evil man, and he puts David in charge because David was a man after God's own heart. So you can even see a little bit of um, that sort of thing, even in the Bible. This is crazy. You're going to laugh. But for money, they used shells. Okay, They would barter. Bartering is when you trade you know, one thing for another. Like at lunch, when you say to your friend, I'll trade you my cheese stick for your fruit snacks, and you trade. But instead of using gold or silver for coins for money, they used shells. So if you wanted to get money, all you had to do is go down to the beach and pick up some shells and bam, you had money. Yeah, they use shells as coins. How crazy is that, right? Um, eventually, the Chinese, uh, in China, the Shang Dynasty is going to get conquered like all dynasties. 700 years is a good run. They're going to get taken over by the Zhou Dynasty. I know it looks like Chow, but that's not how you say it. It's called the Zhou Dynasty. And the Zhou Dynasty is basically going to double in size, and they're going to rule China for a pretty long time, too. And we'll talk, some, we'll talk more about what the Zhou Dynasty accomplishes um, when we get to our textbooks in the, uh, in the weeks to come. Okay? Probably, however, the most famous dynasty is where China actually gets its name from, um, and that is the Qin Dynasty, or the Qin Dynasty is how you actually say it. And the crazy thing about this dynasty, they didn't rule for centuries. Um, the emperor, um, Qin Shin Hong Li, he was only in charge for about um, 30 years, okay? And he set up his dynasty, which only lasted for about 20 years. And basically after he died, his empire came to an end because he's a really evil guy and the people were happy to get rid of him. But this dynasty, which only lasted a few decades, was so powerful, so influential, accomplished so many things that it's one of the most famous dynasties in Chinese history. So much so that literally the name China was named after this dynasty, even though they were only in power for you know less time than I've been alive. Okay, I've been alive for 34 years, and I've already outlasted this dynasty. So even though they were here for a short amount of time, they still had so much influence. So what did they do? Well, some of these things you'll recognize. Um, he's the one who built the Great Wall of China, or at least started to. It would be finished by dynasties after him. Okay. Um, if you've ever heard of the Terracotta Warriors, I'll show you a picture of them here in a second. The famous statues of the Chinese warriors. Um, he's the one who, who built those. Okay, he was a ve Quin, Quin Shin Hyung was a very harsh, very wicked guy, um, but he was effective. He was he was a, a dictator. We would say today he was a tyrant. He was a very very evil guy, but he got things done. A lot like a Diocletian before Constantine took over in Roman times. 
Um, anyone who did not agree with him, particularly scholars or members of the uh, Confucius religion, Confucius, Confucianism, um, he hated those guys. If you had a different thought than him, particularly he hated people who were educated because educated people tend to think for themselves, and he doesn't like that. He would prefer that you think what he tells you to think. And so he had a lot of people killed. Um, or he would arrest them, and they would not go to jail. Instead of going to jail, they would be sent north to build the wall. So if he arrested you, you're not going to prison, you're going to basically a construction camp, and you're going to be building the wall. Speaking of the wall, the Great Wall of China is freaking huge, okay? It's not a straight line. Obviously, they're building in mountains, so it's going to wind and curve and tilt and turn. But lots of people were sent here to build the wall, millions, and several thousands of them would die every day from starvation, okay? Um, they would build, they would heat the bricks, and then you would basically have these peasants who would then begin building the wall, and it was basically just slave labor. Today, you can see the wall, you can see the bricks, and this thing goes on and on for miles, okay? It is very, very steep. It is very, very huge, all right? Here it is on Google Earth. You can see the wall it goes on for thousands of miles. And in some places, it's so steep, you can't even walk up it. It's, it's pretty insane. So here are some quick facts about the Great Wall. It is 13,000 miles long. That is almost four times the width of the United States. All right, the U.S. from, from the Pacific Ocean, California, to, to New York, Atlantic Ocean, is only about 3,000 miles wide. So if you got on an airplane and went from New York to Los Angeles and you went back and forth four times, that is the length of the Great Wall of China, okay, for United States. It's pretty ridiculous. Um, the Great Wall itself is about 25 feet high. Some places are a little taller, some places are a little lower, but the average height of the wall is 25 feet high. The, the thickness of the wall, it's 21 feet wide. That is huge, all right? It would make the wall that Donald Trump wanted to build look, you know, not very good. It'd be a great wall, huge wall, love the wall. Well, no, the Great Wall is great for a reason. Trump's wall is a baby wall compared to the Great Wall, okay? And again, these laborers, aka slaves or prisoners, um, would build it. And that, the building never stopped. If you drop dead from, star from starvation or exhaustion, well, they would just build over you. You basically became the mortar. Your, your bones and your body became buried under the wall or in the wall. And they just kept building, and you'd be buried underneath it. So the Great Wall is a tomb for probably hundreds of thousands of dead bodies that have obviously long since turned to ash and dust in the last few thousand years. Um, the Great Wall, some, a few emperors had started building it but, and before him, and some were building it after him, but no one did as much building as Quinn. He did the most building of any of the people who came before him and all the people who came after him. He did the most. Um, and uh, finally, just the terracotta warriors. These are the famous statues. When the king died, he had to go into the afterlife. And in case he needed his army to protect him in the afterlife, he had statues built. And the, the idea was that these statues would come to life and would protect him in the afterlife. Woo! Even though most of them were headless. But anyways, so it was a pretty cool discovery to find that stuff. Um, this was our brief introduction to China. Again, go back, watch notes, pause whatever you have to pause and we'll go into more detail about China in the days and weeks to come.